Welcome to Helderberg College of Higher Education. Twice a year, Helderberg College dedicates a week of spiritual emphasis. That's this week. I'm standing here on the campus of Helderberg College of Higher Education, here at the Bell Tower. Now we know because of online learning, the majority of you are not able to be here with me on campus. And so we want to bring to you Helderberg College's campus this week. That's why we'll be having students singing in the beautiful and the wonderful surroundings of Helderberg College campus. We will be also having wonderful words of life coming from Dr. Christian Okoto. He is a Christian educator and an Adventist pastor. He was born in Cameroon and he has served as a Bible teacher, as a school chaplain, and he is currently serving as the Vice President of Academic Administration at our Adventist University in Haiti. So you don't want to miss it. He's speaking under the subject, Sheep of the Most High. Now let me posit to you today that you are a sheep and I am a sheep. Why would I say such a thing? Go with me to Psalm chapter 100. David writes there, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lambs. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. And so we're inviting you, we're welcoming you to join us in this week of spiritual emphasis. Right now, would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Our Father and our God, we recognize that we are sheep of the Most High, and we want to dedicate not only this week, but ourselves, our hearts, and our minds into your capable, your compassionate, and your considerate hands. May your will be done in our lives. We pray, Father God, for all those who will be tuning in, those who will be watching, those who will be listening, and we pray, above all things, that your will would be made manifest in our lives. May you be glorified, and may we, your sheep, be edified in Jesus' name. Amen. As we gather, may we glorify your name. Knowing well that as our hearts begin to worship, we'll be blessed because we came. We'll be blessed because we came. This steadfast love of Jesus, his mercy shall never come to an end. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. To the Helderberg College family, administration, faculty, staff, and students, 
It is my utmost privilege to be part of you for this week of spiritual emphasis for the year 2021. You have chosen as a theme, saved by grace, saved by grace. I would invite you to bow your heads with me as we seek the grace of Christ in delving into his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy, what a privilege to begin this important event in the life of Helderberg College and in the lives of your children who serve and study there. As we begin, we claim your promise of your continual presence with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask that you grant each one of us an attentive ear and most importantly, an obedient heart so that we may be able to understand and most importantly, obey your word. This is our humble prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray and the church said, Amen. Saved by grace. Let me first highlight this point that every picture that I've used for this presentation has been duly referenced. So there is no fear of copyright issues. I have chosen to speak about Psalm 23. And the sub-theme that I have chosen is Sheep of the Most High. And as usual, for every session, we will begin by reading Psalm 23. Psalm 23 goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord is blessed. Psalm 23 is actually a celebration of the shepherd, the good shepherd. And we know who that shepherd is. And for the first message, what we want to look at is verse 1. Remember, the sub-theme is Sheep of the Most High. And the topic for the hour is My Shepherd. So we are focusing on verse 1 of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yes, David, who wrote the psalm, affirmed without questioning that the Lord is or was his shepherd. And because the Lord was his shepherd, he couldn't be able to want anything because the Lord provided for him everything that he needed as his child. This verse shows three things. First, it shows the permanent sovereignty of God. That's why the name used there is the Lord. When you use the word Lord or the name Lord, you're hitting straight at the sovereignty of God. And in this case, the permanent sovereignty of God. Because David didn't say the Lord was my shepherd or the Lord will be my shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. 
The second thing to note is that Psalm 23 verse 1 hints at the total dependence of man. You see, because the Lord is the shepherd, there is an intended in idea about the sheep. And when you know the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, you understand that there is a relation of dependence. So David is affirming without apology. He is affirming without shame. He is affirming without fear that he is dependent on God. The third thing that Psalm 23 verse 1 highlights is the complete provision of God. You see, David says that he will not want anything, not because he has everything, but because he knows the shepherd who owns everything. You see, David understood that everything that he was, everything that he had came from the Lord. So you see straight on that the verse, the first verse of Psalm 23, hints at God and his relationship with man. Yes, God is the sovereign. God is the provider. And because he is the sovereign and the provider, I shall not want. I am his sheep and therefore I must live in total dependence before him. The God of the Bible, let me, let me drop this bomb. The God of the Bible, let, let me drop this bomb now, Helderberg. The God of the Bible does not want to meet your expectations. He wants to exceed them. Let, let me say it again. The God of the Bible doesn't want to meet your expectations. He wants to exceed them. If there is any ounce of doubt in your mind about this, remember that Abraham asked or was expecting a son and God gave him nations. Yes, the God of the Bible does not want to meet your expectations. He wants to exceed them. If you still doubt, ask Hezekiah. When he was sick, King Hezekiah prayed and he asked for healing and God granted him healing, but beyond healing, Healing, God granted him additional 15 years and a miracle in which the sun had to go backward 10 degrees. The God of the Bible does not want to meet your expectations. They are too low for him. He has higher expectations for you. And he wants to exceed your expectations. If you still doubt, ask Lazarus and his family. They asked for a healing and they got a resurrection. If you still have doubts, ask Moses. Who was thinking about death at age 80. But God granted, he granted him 40 additional years as the head of state of the greatest nation that ever existed on planet earth. If you still doubt, ask Anna. She asked for a boy and God gave her a judge. And he gave her a great man in the name of Samuel and more children. If you still doubt, ask Solomon. And if you still doubt... Ask Adam, who didn't even ask anything, and God gave him more than everything. So the God of the Bible, who is my shepherd, who is your shepherd, does not want to meet your expectations. They are too low for him. He wants to exceed them. Isn't he the Lord who wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we even think or ask? So when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, he knows what he means. When he comments, I shall not want. And I ask permission to God to paraphrase this uh, Psalm 23 verse 1 because what I'm going to drop now is another bomb. You see, if, if, if I may rewrite that verse, I would say the Lord is my shepherd and I am his sheep. S-H-E-E-P. What does that mean? It means that what God wants more than anything is a relationship 
with us. S-H-E-E-P. Sometimes I use words that are not in the dictionary yet. Please don't quote me in your essay. But I make up these words because they speak to me. And I hope this word speaks to you when I say that the Lord Jesus, God of heaven, wants a relationship with us. God wants you to be his sheep. Tender, docile, humble, because when you are that way, you can confidently say, I shall not want. Why? Because you give control, total control to God. And when God is in charge, you shall not indeed want. So the question I might ask myself now is, do I have a relationship with the Lord? Because sometimes we have what I call a fictional relationship with God. A relationship that sounds more like a transaction in which God gives me what I want and I give him what I can, when I can. What God wants more than anything is a relationship with us. In John 10, 11 and 14, Jesus identified himself as that shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd because there's a bad shepherd. And that shepherd you don't want to follow. And that bad shepherd had several names. One of them is the devil, is Satan. And there is another bad shepherd within us. It's called self. You cannot rely on self and expect not to want anything. So Jesus is the good shepherd. He unapologetically declared that I am the good shepherd. And he said, I know my sheep and I'm known of my own. In other words, it's the two-way traffic. Jesus knows me and I know Jesus. I remember a pastor preaching one day at church and he asked a question and the, the sermon was about knowing Jesus. And on the first day he asked the church, how many of you know Jesus? And everyone raised his hand. And the next week he came back with the same idea and he asked a second question. He said, today, how many of us are known of Jesus, not one hand showed up. Because sometimes we have this fictional idea that we know Jesus. In fact, when he doesn't know us, when you go to the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount, you hear Jesus at the end saying, not, everything, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And what did he say to those who thought because they prophesied, because they did miracles in his name, because they went to church, because they sang in the choir, because they gave tithe and offering, because they teach Sabbath school, because they do all this good stuff. And they thought that they were on track to heaven and, and to eternity. And Jesus said, I never knew you. Brethren, my friend, it is possible to do the things of God without God. And that's not what David is talking about. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known of my own. In Colossians 2, 9 and 10. You see, when we have a relationship with Jesus, we need to understand what we get from it. There is a lot more to get from Jesus than a car. There is a lot more to get from Jesus than a mansion here on earth. There is a lot more to get from Jesus than a bank account, a heavy bank account. There is more to get from Jesus than just a beautiful spouse or wonderful kids and a, and a job and a, and a degree and another degree and a position and a leadership position. There is more to get from Jesus than just healing physical healing 
Jesus is our shepherd and therefore we shall not want because he is the provider. He is the sovereign Lord. In him, listen to this, in him all the fullness of the Godhead bodily is and you are complete in him. You see, Jesus is everything. Jesus has everything. Jesus is everything we need. Jesus has everything we need. And we are complete only in Him. In other words, without Jesus, we are incomplete. If we were in a church setting, in a normal church setting, I will ask you to turn to your neighbor. And if you can, you, if you have a neighbor, turn to your neighbor now and, say, and tell your neighbor, neighbor, without Jesus, you are incomplete. And tell your neighbor, without Jesus, I am incomplete. And the fact is, we are complete only when we are in Jesus. And Jesus is in us. So you see how important it is to have that relationship with him. That in fact, truly, he will be our shepherd and we will be his sheep. Because there are some people who are wolves and they call Jesus shepherd. He doesn't know such people. And I do pray from the bottom of my heart that none of us listening to me now is a wolf, but a sheep, a genuine sheep that counts on Jesus and Jesus for everything. Now let me talk to you a little bit about Jesus now. You see, in the book of Mark, there is a, I don't know if it's 24 hours, but at least it is within 24 hours, just one day. Of what Jesus did. You see in the book of Mark 35 to 41. You have the tempest on the sea at night. It was a terrible tempest. But Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples woke him up. And as he woke up he spoke to the wind. He spoke to the waves. And everything came, became quiet. And that day, Jesus demonstrated how much power he has over natural forces. Did you know what happened right after that the next morning? Let me tell you, when you go to Mark 5, we are within 24 hours of Jesus' activities. You see, in Mark 5, right after stepping out of the boat, two men came, demon-possessed, and one of them was called Legion because the demons were so many in that person at Jesus. Jesus' word, the man was set free. In that morning, after showing his power over natural forces, Jesus demonstrated his power over supernatural forces in a few hours. And right after that, he met a woman in Mark 5, 25 to 34. He met a woman who had been bleeding to death for 12 years, and she just had to Touch him and she got healed instantly. You see, Jesus demonstrated his power over physical ailments. And last but not least, in Mark 5, 35 to 42, he met the daughter of, a, of Jairus who was dead. And he resurrected her. And Jesus, within 24 hours, demonstrated his power over natural forces, over supernatural forces, over physical ailment, even over death. Do you know Jesus? Do you know the shepherd? Do you know who he is? Do you know what he can do? Do you know what he plans for you? That's the Jesus I'm talking about. So when you talk about the shepherd, you talk about Jesus, you know exactly what it means to say, I shall not want because I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus has all that power. But I would like you not to misunderstand the message today. That Jesus, when he came on earth, he went to his home church at Nazareth. One Sabbath morning. Yes, Jesus went to church on Sabbath. And they asked him to preach and they gave him the Bible, the then Bible. And the Bible says that he found in the book of Isaiah, he found, meaning that he searched and he was intentional that day. And he found a passage that is uh, scripted in the book of Luke 4. 
But the original text was in Isaiah 61, and that's the text I want to read to your hearing. On that blessed Sabbath morning, Jesus wrote, wrote, uh, read this passage in Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3. The, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Jesus, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Jesus continued to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. He didn't stop there. He said to console those who mourn, I want to say at Helderberg, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Verse 3, that they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he may be glorified. You can divide this passage into three sections. Number one, the spirit of the Lord section, which is the anointing. Jesus is the anointed one. And the anointing is in Jesus, not for any other purpose, but to heal, but to preach, but to proclaim, but to console, but to give beauty, but to change, to do us good. So it is within the power, the limits of the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is able or was able at his time to heal that woman who bled for 12 years. It is because of the power of the Holy Spirit that he was able to quiet the waves and the wind. It is because of the power of the Holy Spirit that he could speak the demons out of those two gentlemen that were suffering. It is because of the power of the Holy Spirit that he was able to resurrect Jairus' daughter. But this was not the end. You see, there is a fake gospel that uses the gospel and twists the gospel. And I'm going to show you how because we're talking about sheep of the Most High. We're talking about saved by Jesus. Isaiah 61 in verse 3 ends like this that Jesus heals that Jesus preaches that Jesus teaches that Jesus sets free for one reason that they may be called trees of righteousness you see all the healing and the teaching and all the miracles were not an end in and by themselves Jesus healed because he wanted to save. Let me say it differently. If your Jesus buys you or gives you a car but doesn't save you, that's not my Jesus. That's not my shepherd. It's your Jesus. I do not recognize him. If your Jesus grants you a position or possessions or a spouse or what you think you want and doesn't save you, that's not my Jesus. If your Jesus heals you even of cancer or of COVID but doesn't save you, that's not my Jesus. Because my Jesus came to seek and search for the lost in order to save them. You see, there is a confusion that many people make between the ministry and the mission of Jesus. I hope you can see this on the screen. Jesus used four strategies in the word of God. He was an example. He modeled the gospel. Then he healed and he taught and he preached. So Jesus was an example. He used healing and preaching and teaching and modeling as ministerial strategies. So this was how he ministered to the people. But ministering to the people is not an end in or by itself. 
There was a purpose, a higher purpose for Jesus' ministry. It was to fulfill his mission. In other words, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. In other words, my Jesus wants to save you. If he heals you, it's because he wants to save you. If he blesses you on one, one, one way, it's because he wants to save you. You see... There is a confusion among us about the gospel. You see those things that we think the shepherd must give us, we have twisted it. In fact, sometimes we preach and teach and believe that the gospel is the ice on the cake. And that the cake are those things that Jesus does for us. That's the twisted gospel. The real gospel. The real, real, real gospel is this. Lord, give me grace. That the cake is salvation. And the icing, the icing, the icing is the healing. The icing is the deliverance. The icing is all those things that we think we want or we need. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom, the gospel, the cake, and all these things. The icing shall be added unto you. If Jesus hasn't saved you yet and he's blessed you, I'm sorry, this is a monumental waste of God's grace. In Christ, God is the permanent sovereign who provides completely for whoever depends on him totally, especially in the lens of salvation. Ellen G. White said that Jesus knows us individually and is touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He knows us all by name. He knows the very house in which we live, the name of each occupant. He has at times given directions to his servants to go to a certain street in a certain city, to such a house, to find one of his sheep. Jesus knows you individually. And that's my Jesus who wants beyond everything to save you. He is my shepherd. I heard the story of an actor in ancient times, a very brilliant actor, very eloquent, who at the end of each of his performance used to recite Psalm 23 to the hearing of his audience, his faithful audience. He was really a spectacular actor, well-trained. And every time he recited Psalm 23, he received a standing ovation from the audience. And as the, the audience was enthused by the excellence and the quality of his recitation, his heart was filled with grief and pain because many of you may not know that what actors want most are not your claps, but your tears. So he was trying to find a way to make the audience cry. And the more he tried, the more they clapped. And they gave him a bigger standing ovation. And each time he was so disappointed. And one day, an ordinary man from the audience told him, Would you allow me, sir, to recite the psalm tomorrow? At the end of your performance. And as a gentleman. He said of course my dear. And surely on the next day. At the end of his performance. He invited that man. That ordinary man with no training in actorship. And, and he said. This gentleman wants to recite the shepherd's psalm. 
And the man came up front and he turned to the audience and with his frail composure, he looked down and he wasn't even able to look at the people in the eye. He was shaking like crazy. And, and he began to recite Psalm 23, the shepherd psalm. And in the middle, before the end of the psalm, the whole audience was in tears, in heavy tears. And at the end, the actor, the professional actor called him and said, what do you think you have better than me more than me how come you have done this you such an untrained person a commoner how were you able to do what I've been trying to do with all my training and the man looked at the actor the professional actor and said you, you see you really want to know the difference between you and I let me tell you this is the difference you know the psalm i know the shepherd you see there are many professional christians who know scripture who teach scripture who quote scripture but don't know jesus is jesus your shepherd today my prayer is this, Lord, make me thy ship. Lord, make me thy ship. This is my prayer. And if it is yours, I invite you to bow your head, close your eyes, as we seek God's grace in prayer. Heavenly Father, our hearts are overwhelmed with your word that has lifted Jesus as our Savior. Yes, he provides. Yes, he sustains. But more than anything, Jesus wants to save us. And many times we've not been able to appreciate that salvation. In fact, many times we have depreciated that salvation. We repent, O oh Lord, and we pray for forgiveness and cleansing and deliverance. And we pray that each one of us will become your sheep and develop a genuine, lasting, growing, fruitful relationship with you. Be blessed, be honored, and be with us throughout this week of spiritual emphasis. And I'd like to commit your people at Helderberg and all those watching or listening, that they too may be able to experience Jesus at the very personal level. If there is anyone at the sound of my voice at this moment who is hurting for one reason or the other, who has lost appetite, who has lost sleep because of an issue, an overwhelming issue, by the compassions of Jesus of Nazareth, may you please, Lord, touch that person wherever he or she is hurting now and speak healing, peace, and salvation. This is our humble prayer. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen.